Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's Calm Versant is Dr. Az Hakim, who is a deeply and broadly experienced psychologist based in the UK. He has spent decades working with persons who suffer from aberrant sexuality and gender issues and has developed some novel approaches to helping people sort through their distress prior to and post-medicalizing. And in this conversation, we talk about his thoughts on gender as a trend within the medical system and also within culture, and the way that we can think about that beyond the culture war dynamics. Found him to be very entertaining, very fascinating, and all around a good guy. If you want to check out his works, he does have a book on detransition or on the gender craze more broadly, and he gets into the psychodynamics and the sociological influences of this topic, and all the links to all of his work are down there in the description. Without further ado, here is Dr. Az Hakim. I was listening to your interview with Stella and Sasha Ayad. Oh, yeah. I guess they've become personal friends of mine just because we've interacted so much on this particular topic that you were in quite a bit before it became the nuclear. I've been doing this since 2000, so 23 years. Yeah. And um, people say, why are you specializing in this very esoteric uh, field? Because no one's seeing it for what it is. And people just humoring going, yeah, yeah, fine. Um, and now it's reached world awareness because of, well, how it's sort of taken over and captured everyone's thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I come with a, a lot of years of experience. Why do you think it's so infectious, just as an idea? Like trans identity. It's so infectious. It just seems like well because it's been fueled by socio-political lobby groups so um stonewall has a lot to do with it you know when stonewall um are we started or not <laughs> yeah we're, we're rolling oh fine um so stonewall has a lot to do with it i mean you know for those people who don't know stonewall did brilliant work fighting for equal rights for gay and lesbian people for decades and then in when especially in britain when they got to the stage where they'd achieved everything they, they wanted to achieve they had um equality and everything and they had gay marriage they they had a meeting and they said what do we do now do we disband and say that we've been a success or do we do we find a new cause and they said well well we've got all this funding so let's find a new cause and let's go for trans ideology and 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 some people said fine and other people said no, this is what this isn't what we signed up for and they left and they formed the lgb alliance okay and stonewall have been on a mission to um capture organizations and it's a bit like a cuckoo syndrome as in they've got in the nest of uh, lgb and purport themselves to be about sexuality and gay rights but actually it's like a trojan horse they're using that to fuel um, uh, gender ideology, which is part of the whole social justice theory, new religion, the new cult. We all thought religion was dead. It's not. There's a new religion, and it's called social justice theory, and it's not based in reality. It's based on um, a belief system, mm -hmm. and that's the new the new religion, which has captured uh, everyone and especially people under the age of a certain age and all the young people, they're, they're, um, they're believers. Yeah. Do you think that there could have been something else uh, besides disbanding and trans ideology that Storm Stonewall could have put their efforts into? Well, I think they could have. I mean, th there isn't much to fight for, for le lesbian and gay rights. But Unless, they, well, I guess just internationally they could have done that. But that's yeah, not... absolutely. They could, have gone, they could have gone to countries where... It isn't. Uh, there isn't equality. They could have gone to the Middle East. They could have gone to the Far East. They could have gone to Africa. So they could have done that, but they chose to stay put and find a new cause. So yeah. I totally agree. They should have kept with the cause and gone further afield. Yeah. I just, I interviewed uh, a lawyer and a, uh, I guess, uh, their client who were suing uh, um, some doctors or, or organizations for transitioning shapeshifters her online name she got transitioned or he she Ooh. got transitioned due yeah. to and part of the case is about internalized homophobia and how the trans ideology um or the doctors who transition shape just didn't even look into the possibility of internalized uh 
homophobia. And in the conversation you had with Stella, you guys kind of hit on that, this kind of new fangled homophobia. And I was just, it just makes me wonder, is that like a persistent cultural and psychological um, phenomena? Like this, this perception or this belief or this feeling that homosexuality, there's something wrong about homosexuality. If you look at the clinics where the, the, uh, transing of children has come from. Um, they're, for example, some kids, the, the, the Tavistock Child Gender Clinic kids. So I, I, I trained and worked at the Tavistock and Portman Clinics. Uh, I was there for 12 years. I was never part of GID. I was attached to GIDS for two years. I, 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 and my the 23 years I've worked in gender, is it's purely been in psychotherapy. I've never given anyone hormones, never referred people to surgery. I, I wouldn't. Um, but when I sat in on GIDS, um, the very old-fashioned institutionalised homophobia, which is evident at the Tavistock. I mean, when I trained at the Tavistock, we had two terms of lectures on the pathology of homosexuality. Okay. You know, the Tavistock is, you know, I know people who have been turned down for training and employment at the Tavistock because they were gay. Um, and people as recently as 2006 were told that they couldn't be appointed because they were gay. And it flew in the face of their conventional psychoanalytic understanding where a gay person hasn't navigated their way successfully through the Oedipal complex. So how could they possibly be working as a therapist and that yeah. nonsense? And when I spoke to a person very high up in GIDS and I said, look, what, 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 isn't what you're doing a bit mad? I mean, if you left these these kids alone, these boys alone, wouldn't we just know that most of them would turn up to be um, happy, comfortable gay people? And his response to me was, well, which is more mad, if they were trans or if they were gay? And that, that, that summed it up for me, is mm. that them turning out to be gay and happy with their bodies without a gender problem was felt to be worse than if they were to be heterosexualized and trans. Yeah. And when I was with them, there was no exploration, there was no thinking, there was no questioning. It was just affirmation. And it was painful to watch. And I, I was the resident troublemaker saying every week, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing and, and you know, I I then passed the baton on to Sue, who then uh, became Evans. famous helping Kira Bell. Yeah. Um, and we, we overlapped for a bit and we were the two troublemakers. Um, but no, it's it's rife. And the the population I see, there's... And one, one of the problems is that we now call things trans. I mean, there's no such thing as trans. They're, they're a group, you know, from what I, I came into the field with a proxy understanding. And I, I then got some understanding from literature, which was written by people who'd seen about five people, which wasn't really... You know, and then over the years, seeing people, I saw people for an hour to an hour and a half a week for therapy, some of them up over 10 years. So I knew these people inside out. And I know there's not one thing called trans. There's lots of things which we're grouping together as trans. So even as simply as what we used to call transsexuals, transvestites, fetishistic transvestites, yes autogynophiles, and then within transvestites, in my first book, I describe 11 different types of transvestites. Oh. Yeah, yeah. You Breaking down by what? Like persistence and uh, color? No, no, no. So if you, you, can divide fetish, you can divide transvestites into those who cross-dress because they want to temporarily look like a woman. Say, Let's say a man who's a transvestite. They want to temporarily look like the opposite sex, like a woman, and the, for other people to perceive them as a woman. You have people who are transvestites because, not for anyone else to see them, but because they're turned on by the texture of the fabric on their skin. So theirs is a far more textural fabric one. You get people who are transvestites because they feel very underconfident in their, in their gender. They feel emasculated. And they might dress up as what you might call a bad transvestite and go out, and I had one of these who'd go out and walk around schools at playtime when the children were out playing, and he would know that all the children would jeer and point and go, that's a man. Okay. And paradoxically, he got some sense of of being feeling truly masculine by people pointing and telling him he was oh, a man. Normally, he didn't. I had other people who did that because they were 
primarily sadomasochists and they wanted to masochistically be humiliated. And so there's so there's loads of different things. You so the, there's lots of different ways that people can present as either transvestite or transsexual. Yeah. And if you look at my transsexuals, so the people who want a permanent bodily change, my males a hundred percent on the autistic spectrum. Not the transvestites, not the old gynophiles, not the fetishists, that those ones weren't. But the people who are very fixed in a a man is this, 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 and this. A woman is this, 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 and this. Yes. I'm not like this, therefore I must be the other, which is a woman. You know, they're, they're very autistic, very black and white binary thinking. They are the opposite of gender non-conforming. Because rather than someone saying, hey, look, you know, you've got this gender framework. I don't fit in, but your framework's wrong, you know. I'm I'm subverting boundaries. Look at me, I'm being creative. Like the New Romantics in the 80s, you know, Boy George, Marilyn, all the New Romantics, they they weren't pretending to be the opposite sex. They were saying, look, I'm confusing what your perception of gender is, but I'm yeah. not I'm not saying I'm not a man or not a woman. Yeah. So that so the, the autistic mind cannot be subversive, it cannot challenge boundaries. They're slaves to a framework. Mm -hmm. So if they feel they don't fit in with one, then they they I must be other. So I must change myself to fit into the other and adopt all all the stereotypical sort of things that women have been trying to shed their 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 for, for years, but they're clinging on to them. So the males were autistic. The biological females, some were autistic. A lot of them had trauma. And there's a load of trauma, and a lot of them had internalized lesbophobia. And it was either internalized or externalized. You know, they might have come from a family where it was completely unacceptable to be gay. And they may have internalized that and felt it was completely unacceptable. So the, the women were more heterogeneous. More, there's more difference in the female group. The males totally all um, on, the, on the spectrum. But they're, you know, they're high functioning on the spectrum. So it doesn't come to anyone's notice. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, but but absolutely. Whereas mm -hmm. the transvestites and the autogynophiles, they weren't. They were more... That was more of an excitement thing, more of a sexualization thing. Okay. The, so you just cast a huge net, and I, I want to try to figure there's like There's a phenomenon happening right now, like this really stupid discourse about a guy in a dress, and it has to do with his sexuality or his perceived sexuality or his admitted sexuality with autogynophilia. And there's, there's this war on trying to draw a line between perversion and acceptable sexuality. And... And people don't, they want to stop at homosexuality. They, they want to say there's heterosexuality, homosexuality, and maybe this thing called bisexuality, but any other sorts of sexuality beyond that are perverse. And we're not going to normalize that. We're not going to enable that because that's how we get uh, people marrying their dogs and, and uh, messing mm -hmm. around with children. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering from a, from a psychological point of view or like a clinical point of view, how do you navigate or how have you developed a perception of what is positive sexuality or negative sexuality, socially acceptable sexuality uh, or socially uh, sexuality that needs to be socially denigrated. So where I was doing this work was the Portman Clinic in London, which is the only uh, forensic psychotherapy clinic, which was, it started off as the clinic this, for uh, the Institute for Studying Sexual Deviance or something. It was set up by the Bloomsbury Group, people like H.G. Wells and this artist, and they set up this clinic to study per sexual perversion yeah. and then later on they had to change the name because it wasn't very pc they changed it to the portman clinic um but it but it started off with its roots of studying sexual perversion so i was immersed in sexual perversion with my patients for for the for the for the entire time i was there so i got quite a good understanding of it and you know you might think there's just heterosexuality homosexuality and bisexuality but there's a whole raft so you have object related sexuality where it's a, a person yeah, so men, women, both, or children, pedosexualities. And within pedosexualities, there's a huge range, whether you're attracted to infants, young children, adolescents, or, or you know, not quite legal late teenagers. And then you've got um, fetishists. And the, the, the by definition, the fetish is a sexual attraction to something inanimate. So, you know, the shoe fetish or the, you know, I, I had a hair fetishist and they didn't care what the hair was attached to, man, woman, cat, dog, horse, didn't care, the hair. And you Like know, a and type of hair, like a pompadour or like a... Any uh, hair, any hair. So any hair, a horse's okay. tail, a horse's mane, a furry dog, woman with long hair, an elderly woman, a young child, anything, it was just the hair. It didn't, it didn't matter what it was attached to, but his primary sexuality was hair. 
I had people, you know, we had the coprophilics where they were they were only turned on by shit. You know? Oh, okay. I thought you said copper for that'd be weird. No copper lasting for pennies on their body for, or something. Yeah. For shit. Yes. You know, people who immerse themselves in baths of feces and then yep. orgasm. You had people who could only get turned on by having an MRI scan. You know, you so and, yep. and you get concept sexualities. Concept sexualities are not a thing but a process. So you had people who like say the Pure sadomasochism is not about the person, it's the type of sadomasochistic relationship. And you had you know, I had someone who with asphyxiation fetish. So, you know, it was all about asphyxiation, not particularly that bothered with, whether it was with someone or not, it was just about asphyxiation. So there's concept sexualities as well. And what what I tended to see was that the the really autistic transsexuals didn't really have a sexuality. They were asexual. Because it's very common in, in autism to be asexual. And people don't believe that that's the thing, but it is. And you talk to them about sexuality, and it's this icky, horrible, oh, why do people want to do that? I'm not interested in it. Yeah. But if you, if you have a sexuality, you can't really entertain or like the idea of doing anything that doesn't correspond with that. So if you're gay, the idea of having sex with a, the opposite sex is a real turn-off. And if you're straight, similarly, if you're... If, you know, but if you don't have a sexuality, you also might not have the aversion response. So mechanically, you can have sex, and you mechanically have an orgasm, but you don't have the erotic libidinal thing. Yeah, and it's a bit like being colorblind. If you've never had an erotic libidinal sexual excitement, you don't know because you might have an orgasm, like a physical one, but not a mental one. That noise in the background is my bulldog drinking water. Um, always likes to join in. <laughs> and what what I tend to see was there were some transsexuals who might have been friends with someone of the opposite sex and had mechanical sex, and then when they trans, they had sex with with another sex to make them heterosexual again. But it wasn't they changed sexuality. Then everybody had a sexuality. They were just being facilitative and and going through the motions. Hmm. Um, and for some of them, they they were quite shocked when they realised this was the case. That they never really fancied their girlfriend. It was just something that they, they were friends, and they, you know, had sex to keep them happy every now and then. And so, so there's the asexuality, which is a big component, which a lot of people don't believe exists because now the picture is so taken over by all the AGPs and the fetishists. Because if you look about the population sample, historically there's always been far more transvestites than transsexuals. Far more. Nobody talks about transvestites now. They yeah. just talk about trans. So the population that we're talking about, trans, is way outnumbered by transvestites and autogynophiles than transsexuals. So all the people that you see online who are sort of, you know, getting sexually excited about being in women's bathrooms and stuff, and they're, they're all the fetishists. But because they're called trans, they have some sort of immunity mm -hmm. to being noticed, called out, or so rather than it being an unacceptable sexuality it's now come under the it's like being a diplomat where you don't get sort of get into trouble for anything they're mm. now trans everything's fine and you know you get people who are who are, who are fetishes transvestites who announce to work that they're trans and they can come in one day a week as cross-dressed but it's not because they're transsexual on a sex change they're just getting turned on Okay, And I say to them, well, it's a bit like if you were a nudist. Would you say to work, can I come in naked one day a week? This is a, why would work entertain your sexual fetish? It's not that you're having a sex change, you're going to go the whole hog. It's, you're, you're just like dressing up. But as soon as you say trans, you're immune from any sort of analytic crit critique. Yeah. Because you'll be transphobic. You're, you're, st uh, you're stunning and brave, suddenly. <laughs> but, well, but, I'm not <laughs> the, the, but what's i guess what where does society draw the line and keep the line and hold the line with regard to what you've called sexual perversion like how do we define sexual perversion and then how do we build a social morality around some some fundamental rational concepts rather than just a disgust response okay. but if we want to use so, a disgust response that's fine but so um, a lot of people say to me, oh, you know, you use the word sexual perversion, that's so intolerant. And so, well, no, you, you don't understand. It's not, I'm not being bigoted. So sexual perversion is, someone beautifully described it as making hate, not making love. It's, it doesn't have that, that loving feeling. It has, it, and it's a solution. So for every sexual perversion, there's a trauma. So 
when when we experience a trauma, so when something bad happens, we have a number of possible responses. We either are fine, nothing happens, or we're a bit upset and go over it, or we develop something on the scale of PTSD, where you get nightmares, flashbacks, and triggered by reminders, mm. or rarely you can triumph over it by sexualizing it. So every sexual perversion can be traced back to an original trauma which the mind has unwittingly sexualized and triumphed over the trauma and it becomes something exciting which they seek out. Yeah. So for every shit fetishist that's covering themselves in shit, there was a little boy who once at a middle-class dinner party his parents took him to, shat his pants and got humiliated. A beautiful example is, a, a, I, w- I would recommend the book to anyone, actually, especially if you like the darker side, is uh, Drowning by Numbers, Dennis Nielsen's biography. Mm-hmm. came out last year. And for those of you who don't know, Dennis Nielsen was a very fear- uh, a famous uh, serial killer in London who um, would uh, uh, bring men home, and then when they were asleep, he would kill them, and he would keep them there. And then when they rotted, he would get rid of them, put them down the drain and get another one. And his original trauma was, I can't remember his grandfather's uncle, but some some big sort of male figure in his life who was, who was his primary good object in his life. He he then died when Dennis was very small. And then he was brought in to see the dead body. And he saw this inanimate dead body. And that was his trauma that he couldn't process. And when our brain can't process something, we return to it again and again. So a bit like the flashbacks or the nightmares, if our onboard data processor can't process a piece of data, we return to it again and again and again. So if you drive past a car crash and look at it, you'll be really reliving that moment because your onboard computer can't process it. And so he he pulled this man in a bar or something and he took him home and he, was, he saw him asleep and that evoked that trauma for him. And in order for him on some unconscious level to process it, he wanted that moment to stay forever. So he killed him. And he just let him lay there so he could then have this processing. And when the man went off, he then has to get another. That's why his his previous biography that someone else wrote was killing for company because he's killing people for their company of their inanimate inanimate state. Yeah. And but there's a lack of I mean, in order to kill somebody, you have to have uh, like a a lack of theory of mind or lack some sort of like, you know, this is another human being. So, so right? interesting theory of mind. So theory of mind is the inability to think of what's happening in the other person's mind, right? And that's a core deficit state in autism. So so not all people with a perversion are autistic, yeah. but sometimes the sexual desire is so great, it can overpower what they would normally restrain them from doing. Mm-hmm. If the draw is that, you know, so you imagine if you were if you were straight and you you were a man you could, you were it was illegal to fancy women you you try and hold it back but there'd be a point where you'd be di- very difficult to so it's the same with anyone with a socially unacceptable sexuality they try not to but then it's very difficult and they end up giving in and th- there's a circle of um, hmm. the, the the intrusive thought of something that they know is strange or weird and doesn't make sense but they really want to do and they they're conflicted about it. And then the libido rises up, and then they then they just reach a threshold and go, sod it, I'm doing it. Then they do it. There's a massive sexual excitement, and then as soon as the the sexual arousal is finished, it's then replaced by massive guilt and shame and depression. And there's that vicious circle that ensues. So all the people we saw with a very strange or perhaps socially unacceptable sexualities describe that vicious circle of perverse excitement, arousal shame and disgust again and again but it's not society's job to normalize that so that to less to lessen the the no i think society's not normalizing it but when you have a trojan horse where you where it says well no this is trans and society's been told trans is okay don't question it it's transphobic it may not everyone thinks trans means oh people want to sex change they want to live the opposite sex it doesn't. Most people who are trans are transvestites, and within those, fetishes, transvestites, and autogynophiles. So it's the Trojan horse. Yeah. We're thinking, oh, no, it's a, and also the, some people think it's a sexuality itself. So I, I, when I was a consultant in the NHS, so there was a there was one of those data collecting forms, and it said, 
which is your sexuality? And the options were heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, or transsexual. I was thinking, but even if an organ, if a health organisation can't even tell the difference, <laughs> what? just because it's got the suffix sexual doesn't mean it's a sexuality. <laughs> so there's a, a, there's a massive lack of understanding yeah. in the population. Yeah. yeah, but okay. So, but there is resistance to. Uh, transgenderism and it's under kind of the umbrella term is gender critical and in and, and the Sasha Stella um, interview you call sure. yourself gender critical so if the gender critical crew want to um, see through that unpack that Trojan horse ultimately they, they want to draw a line in the sand and says this sexuality or this performative sexuality is not ex socially acceptable we don't want to be a part of your fetish right subjecting your co-workers to your sexual excitement is not proper so how do we draw the line like on what basis do we draw the line and what's socially acceptable sexuality this i know this is like ones and zeros but like we're so far off the map that so, so what I would say is, so I'm, I'm, you know, I was, I was probably the first gender critical psychiatrist in the UK. I, um, I was gender critical before I knew what it meant. So, gender critical just means you're critical of gender ideology, where you believe you can be any gender and sex you want to be. And it, I think it's our role to just make people more aware of what it is, and then people in society can make up their own decisions and rules. We're not there to legislate or say you do this, that, this is right, this is wrong. We're not in the this is right or wrong game. Hmm. We're in the this is what it really is. Okay. And you society decide based on the on the complete data set we're giving you. You know, we're not legislators, we're not policemen, we're not society law enforcers. We're just we just want people to understand what it is rather than being hoodwinked into thinking it's something that it's not. Yeah. But do you have no moral uh will, uh, social moral will? Uh, are you well, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not a I'm not a enforcer of you know I, I have my own ethics and morals but yeah. i'm not there to decide on societies i mean i yeah. think society can do that themselves i think as long as they're given the raw data set and they know what it is they can perform their own decisions okay but i just is there no like on how do you know what a perversion is as opposed to uh like a sexuality or a sexual orientation like is it is so it the intensity we, so, of so of i think it, the, you have to take a really detailed assessment, you know, for hours with someone and really have a full understanding of what's happening frame by frame in their mind at every point in, in association with arousal or sort of stuff. And then you see, well, is this something based on on like a, a loving scenario? Okay. Is it a hateful scenario, like like sadistic type of, of sexuality, like a like a sadomasochist thing? Um, is it harmful? Is it harming anyone? Because there's lots of perversions which aren't harming anyone. You know, if, if if someone has a, you know, a sexual fetish for, you know, for, you know, for remote controls of televisions, then that's not going to harm anyone. Let them, you know, that might be a perversion, but it's not harming anyone. So there's got to be a, an assessment of harm and risk. And if it's something really aberrant, really perverse, that's not harming anyone, that's fine. No, no, people can do what they want. So the main concern is whether it harms anyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, uh, but, but you'd, you'd work out, A, whether it's a perversion, B, whether it's harmful, and causing any risk to anyone. Mm-hmm. So, so obviously, if someone's like really turned on by the idea of, of with with a pedosexuality, that's a huge concern. If someone's really turned on by traffic cones, that's not a problem. Yeah. Well, as long as they don't take it on the road, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, is it harming anyone? I don't, well, I, I suppose don't, it's I don't want to see that. Yeah. Talk about PTSD drive-bys, but um, it might be their private road that they've got in the back of their house that no one can see. Yeah, the driveway. <laughs> so behind gate. So your book behind you, <laughs> to switch gears yes. just a bit. Is yes, my D book. My book. So it's called Detrans. It's not just about detransition. It this is the this is the book that you need to read where you will win every argument at a dinner party if you're with someone woke. So this is like the gender critical bible, I'd say. So this is my oh. 23 years of deconstructing gender ideology okay. and saying what it is. A lot, of it, a lot of it is about the people for whom had a sex change and they changed their mind. The detransitioners, and there's the there's the life stories in their own words of their experience and their experience of going from gender confused to oh I'm trans, trans euphoria, and then shit it was a mistake and 
where the hell am I now? What can I do? There's that's they're their stories. Yeah. I've got stories from parents of people. I've got to sisters, and I've got support groups. I've got information, but the but my bits are how how did we get here? What is trans? What is gender ideology? How do we get there? And is it what you think it is, or what is it really? Yeah. So this is the this is the gender critical everything you need to know. Yeah. Um. Um. And it's very readable. Yeah. And, Amazon, Amazon. It'll be linked in the description. Um, I don't have a copy yet. It's on the way, but oh. um, so uh, I'm looking forward to reading it. But so when I asked you why it was so infectious, like gender ideology, uh, you said Stonewall because it's been pushed by activists, and the, we can't underestimate. I mean, you can't ignore that activists have had a very powerful um, lever, and that's how, like in America, all of our major medical associations, professional associations, are yeah. like bending the knee to that because there's this activist pressure. There's this conflation of civil rights with trans trans rights, right? Have you noticed? I don't know about I don't know about in the U.S., but in the U.K., all mainstream media have erased the term gay. I mean, I don't, I'm not really a fan of the term gay. Wait, what? Homosexual have erased the term gay. Really? So I, I've always preferred the term homosexual. I think if heterosexual and bisexual are fine, why call homosexual fine? I think we should work towards destigmatizing homosexual and okay. get it back up there with heterosexual. But okay, if you're going to use gay, that's fine. So no mainstream media, TV, radio, press, use the word gay. Now they just use the term LGBTQ person. Mm-hmm. Which is, a bit, it's a bit like not saying someone's African or Indian or Chinese, just calling them foreigners. BIPOC. You know, it's just, it's just like grouping all these people together. The, yeah. No one's asked me whether I want to be lumped in with uh, the Q's and the T's and the I's. The, it's, 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 it's frankly insulting, but someone from somewhere like, like Stonewall has told them, no, this is what you need to call them now. And there's okay. this sort of overall... So you will not find, if you watch the BBC, Snapchat, ICB, just... Channel 4, you will not find anyone being referred to as gay they are always lgbtq people yeah and then also well there's a lot of true believers right if you look into schools i was looking at your book today on amazon and it gave me a recommendation for not him or her like a parent's guide to the non-binary child right there's something there's something so, fascinating with, so with children so i've got a book in the chapter on ROGD, so rapid onset gender dysphoria. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I know, and hopefully everyone out there knows, there's been a massive increase in kids who suddenly say they're non-binary or trans. Yeah. So wonderful book by Abigail Shreya, who's written a lovely blurb for my book. Oh, nice. Um, her wonderful book, Irreversible Damage, accounts the, you know, talks about the massive 8,000-fold uh, increase in girls um, and, you know, what, why is that? Either there's some sort of pandemic like COVID where people, kids are just catching gender dysphoria left, right and centre. Yeah, something in the water. Or it's a social contagion. And what I say is it's nothing medical at all. It's a youth subculture. So, you know, we've always had youth subcultures since the war. You know, ever since, ever since the Second World War, you've had rockabillies, you've had... Yeah. Mods, you've had punks, you've had goths, you've had whatever it was. And I was, you know, and I was I was a goth, you know, once a goth was a goth, you know, it's all still got the Yeah, I was know. gonna ask about that. I wanted to get into yeah, like it's the, a, it's the, a, the frame yeah, by like frame, goth. like what trauma led you to idolize and uh, the school. Uh, well, for example, so when when I was at my very nice, lovely, comfortable boarding school in North Wales, where you know, it was all very sort of, you know, very nice. And then uh, Jenny turned up with her back combed hair and her purple lipstick and, her, and we're going, oh my God, you're so cool. What are you? And she's like a goth. And within two weeks, the whole of this lovely, respectable public school in, 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 in North Wales were goths. And we're all goths. And now, if someone turns up at school looking like Jenny, and they say, what are you? They go, I'm non-binary trans. The whole school are non-binary trans. They're not really. Yeah. It's, the, it's the new goth. Mm -hmm. And... What someone in the music industry said to me was that um, youth subculture was always focused in music. So if you're Generation X and older, like you know, I'm Generation X, your your identity as a, as a teenager was in the music. So we had all the cuttings out of the of the magazines and all over our books and folders and posters and listening. Yeah. That was our frame of reference. But then for Gen, for Gen Z, who are the social media, a generation 
music is just music now. Your, your identity is in your social media profile. Everything is content. So, yeah. And so you are social content, media too. have replaced the, the function of music. So now you have a subculture which isn't based in music. It's based on social media stuff. And it's the new goth. This is goth mark five. I, I go through the different phases of goth in my book. I'm goth mark one, two. Um, so it's the new. It's you, you, were the, you were there before it was cool. No, no, in Wales we're a bit behind actually. So I was quite late being a god. <laughs> okay. we're all late being a god. I'm not that old. Um, so, so the you know Mark IV goth was emo, and then it became non-binary trans. Yeah. So these kids are just like goths. But you know, when I was a goth, I was you know I was a believer, and if there was a goth identity clinic, I'd have been there. I'd have done anything to increase my goth status, uh, and I'd you know I'd have had my lips tattooed purple, my hair permanently up, yeah. uh, upright. Yeah. But now. The child gender clinics are basically just medicalizing a subculture. Leave them alone. They'll be fine. They'll grow out of it. They'll just, yeah. some will be gay, some of them won't be, but they'll be fine. Well, was there like an essence to goth? Goth? Or was it, yeah, was it like, was there like a, like an, like, like an essence to it? Well, I think it depends on what sort of goth you were. So in our school, it was very much a sort of like an ethereal reading John Paul Sartre saying how everything was pointless and being quite dark and miserable and sort of yeah, like yeah, yeah. pointlessness of everything. I think in other in other places, it might have been a different sort of goth. But we were sort of like a flighty, crushed velvet sort of goth. Yeah, um, it's a feeling then. It's It's a pathos. But it's a, you know, the whole point of a subculture is that transition phase between a child where the world is as your parents tell you it is, and an adult, where well, you've worked out yourself, it's the middle bit where you're going, hang on a minute, maybe the world isn't like what my parents told me. Maybe I need to just subvert things and be, you know, counterculture and find out. So it's all about that subversive stage where you're trying to find it out yourself. Mm -hmm. So whether you, you 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 locate it in this subculture or another, the common the common thread for all you subcultures is subverting things being subversive yeah. and turning things upside down that you'd previously accepted. And then you get over it and you become an adult. Yeah. Have you, have you uh, maintained that subversive relationship to culture yourself? No, I grew up, but you know, yeah. you still have your remnants. So, you know, the, I still like the accessories sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the they're just more expensive these days. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. With inflation, but also the quality. Yeah. But also like going into something such as sexual perversion for a career, like, like that's kind of risky. Oh, well, you're always in the dark side. So, so, you know, if you're, if you're a doctor, you tend to like pathology and you're interested in pathology. So, yeah. uh, you know, when, you know, so if you're going to get inside the head of someone and look around, it's, you, you, you know, at that age, I wanted them to be really interesting. You know? yeah. So, you know, I used to run a therapy group for in a high secure place for people who'd murdered at least one of their parents. Oh, and then at least that, one? Like, like there's least, a minimum number of yeah, uh, Patrick yeah, said? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then after a number of years, I thought, I miss getting people better. You know, I was a doctor, just a, I didn't, I didn't choose pathology. The pathologists can't get people better. There's a look at pathology. And I thought, okay, forensic psychotherapy is interesting because you've got this really interesting pathology that you would never see. It's a privilege to get inside the head of someone that you would never normally meet. Um, but then I miss getting people better. Uh, and I got over that. So now I'm, now I just see lovely, nice people with nice, hardworking jobs with burnouts and trauma and OCD yeah. and depression. The, 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 the weeping well as they're, no, they're lovely. Could, they're lovely people. Yeah. They're lovely, yeah. hardworking people want to get better. So you know, but I, I did my sort of you know superhero trying to do the yeah. see the impossible and what sort of. I did that, got that out of my system, and now I, you know, yeah. Is there is there um, how do you know when you can help someone or not help them uh, with like a pathology, something really uh, like like a perversion, something that we call a perversion. I, what I in the, in the in the whole time I was at that clinic, what I realised is, you cannot change someone's sexuality, you cannot, and I wasn't treating people's sexuality, I was treating a gender thing, and that was totally treatable because it was the gender thing, the transsexual thing, was a uh, a faulty way of data processing and coming to the wrong conclusion, and I'd like it to my A level maths, you know, upper high school maths where. I was rubbish at math. You know, once math stopped becoming about numbers, when it was just a bunch of letters and squiggles, I was not sure what was happening. And 
you had to like solve these complex equations. And I and I do this step by step data process. And I think I got to the answer, but I was over there when I should have been over there. Okay. But in my head, it made sense, but it's completely wrong. So with with the autistic transsexual people, they've they've usually come to a conclusion from some working out of their own, often years before, and they've never had their working through gone through with a teacher or anyone. They've, they've just said, oh, this is the solution. And they've held on to it. So what I do in my, my therapy was, I was going, okay, fine. Look, look, help me understand how you got there. You know, I'm not saying, oh, yes, you are. No, you're not. You know, the affirmation thing is, oh, yes, you are. Uh, but the exploratory thing is, okay, that's really interesting. Let's show me, tell me how you got there. Show me you're working through. Yeah. And they go through their working through with you. And they can sometimes see, having revisited it for the first time, they can sometimes see how their working through doesn't really make sense or it's based on really tenuous presumptions or assumptions and they, they veer off towards here. And then you're able to explore, well, okay, was that, and then you sort of tease out whether they're certain about this. And that, over a process of weeks, tends to be helpful because yeah. they haven't done that before. And they realise that actually... There's lots of false premises that they base their sequential data processing on. Yeah. So part of the work is just letting them solve it themselves then, just giving them Absolutely. A, so a that we're definitely not sitting there going, oh, no, you're not. What we are doing is going, help me understand how you got there. Yeah. You know, I'm interested. Yeah. And they show you. And then, you know, and what I found really good is I, 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 I'm trained in both individual and group analytic therapy. And I started being an individual setting. What I found was that the very black and white binary brain of the trans person was manifest in the one to one situation. So it was like it turned into like, yes, you are, no, you're not type situation. So then I, I put them in a group. And I, I had two groups, I started off, I had one group of post op regretters, which is a very miserable, melancholic, hopeless group. Hmm. I had one group of pre op people who, who are idealizing this fantasized solution would be wonderful. So I put them together, I mixed them together, and I had mixed groups, pre-op, post-op, you know, regressors, autogynophiles, transvestites. And what was great about that was that I was the conductor. They did the work. We all did the work. But the, the analysis was done by each person in the group of each other in the group. And they they say things like, they, they say, well, listening to you, you sound just like me, but you sound mad. And they're going, but hang on. So they're able to identify, reflect, and resonate with things in the group, which is the common group analytic concepts. And that was much more powerful than some smarty pants therapists yes. saying what I thought. It was coming from within them to each other. Yeah. How how is that different than like a social contagion? Uh, like where, where they're they're constantly ruminating and talking themselves into the problem as opposed to talking themselves out of the problem. Like what's the foundational difference? Well, I think uh, well, social contagion is it's it's like an echo chamber, isn't it? Because you've got people who are just sort of, you know, there's there's no critique. Whereas in an analytic group, everything is critique. So as soon as someone said, oh, I, I, I met someone the other day and I was talking to them in a really male way. So someone might say, well, hang on, what's a male way? What's a male way of talking? Or I did this, this was really feminine. What do you mean by feminine? What is it? So every notion of gender was deconstructed. Hmm. And these people were, were very, they gendered everything. I mean, they, they'd get oh, on the okay. bus and they'd say, oh, I bought the ticket in a very male way. It's like, yeah. what's on earth? What's a male way? And you know, that's all deconstructed. So all their evidence for why they are a or b was dismantled by the group and they realized that actually their conclusion was based on a false premise and false false data yeah when you deconstruct gender what do you find like like is there anything there at all or do you think it's completely yeah, there's no uh, problem there's no problem they're fine made up yeah. like, but gender and itself like, like, so, like so a bit like um Okay, so I'm not really a hardcore goth anymore, but my my souvenirs and remnants of that time are a few skull rings. Yeah, and I like black. That, that, that's my, that, those, are my, those are my remnants of my... It's like a holiday souvenir. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people will, would go through the whole gender dysphoria and they'd be fine about their gender, but they might, you know, they might continue to have a few sort of like dress subversions or whatever... But knowing it's not about gender, just because they like it, but they like it as a man or as a woman. You know, they're not, they don't have to change their sex to like it. And, yeah. you know, some of them were a bit, some of them said, well, you know, I just like make out like I'm a bit of a, you know, rock star now. They can, I can get away with looking how I want to. Yeah. They, they, they would, you know, so they would, they would allow themselves to be more subversive in a biological sex gender match way rather than feel they had to change who they are to be subversive. Yeah. So I was I was encouraging people to be subversive. I was saying it's fine to be subversive. Be subversive. Don't change yourself. Just be subversive. Yeah. 
why did I guess like what you were just uh, just talking about about the just gendering every single thing like that. I guess to somebody who would be kind of on the autistic spectrum, once you adopt a framework, then you're always breaking everything down and you're just doing this calculation, male, female, male, female. And so it's almost like a kind of obsessive compulsive disorder. It's just gone off. It, it was like labeling. Every, everything's labeled, like obsessional labeling. Okay. So what I would want to do is say, okay, just remove the label. You put, you like, it's like you've got a house, you've got like, this side of the wall, you've got everything that you consider male, this female. And just, just take me through all these things that you think are female or male. And then, you, then you'd, hmm. you'd help them work out they weren't really male or female. You know, yeah. the, the people were talking about sort of male type of tables and things. And like, it was just ridiculous the amount of things, things they were gendering or, huh. oh, I knew I, was, I should be a, a man because I went to the body shop and I saw this grey wash bag and I liked it. It's like, well, hello, so you can have a grey wash bag. It's fine. It doesn't have to be a man to have a grey wash bag. So there's there's all this micro evidence that they were building up, but none of it was real evidence. And okay. once you break all that down, you realize they realize that they could actually be whatever they want to be without changing their bodies. Yeah. Well, and if they have changed their bodies, then what kind of um, tools for the regretters, the the sisters? Because I so the, like so going the, the through that process was, is pretty. Yeah. Intense. It's. So some of my colleagues would say, well, why are you seeing people who are regressors? Because there's nothing you can do. You can't go back. And I yeah. said, well, if you had someone who would lost their genitals through cancer or lost a husband through death, you can't change those things. Would you, would you not give them therapy? So there's a, there's a mourning type process. So it's more like grief work and helping someone who's bereaved or had a loss who can never get something back and helping them with that therapeutically and rebuild and accept things and you know so 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 even though they may be very body centric we as therapists don't have to be body centric no. you know, just because they've got no genitals doesn't mean they can't have therapy they're still thinking and feeling no. and as a therapist we can still help them think and feel and try and help them with the loss that they've gone through and it was really useful having the regressors with the idealization people because they say, look, you, you, I, I was you once. I sounded just like you. I would not listen to anyone else. I, but, you know, this is what's happened now. And I was just like you. And it's, it's sometimes a shock to them because the only information they get is very one way. And it's very, this is a solution. You'll be fine. It'll be great. Look how great it is. And especially on social media. So they're faced with something far more gritty and real and not in keeping with the manifesto that they've been given. Mm -hmm. What is the, like the general tenets of grief therapy or dealing with laws? It's just about helping people come to terms and accept things. So it's not like a, it's not a manualized thing. It's just, you know, a good therapist is empathic, attuned to the, the patient, what they're thinking and feeling and helping them, work through it so it's that, that that sort of work that you do you know the same with depression or so so you're you're using things that you would normally do as a as a as a good therapist with those those situations um but lots of patients lots of therapists get thrown by trans because they're going oh how do i get i can't get my head around that they're very you know they, they need to get past the whole body trans thing and just think of it in terms that they can deal with yeah um as a human being yeah well, um where are you headed now professionally or like like intellectually like what are what are the fields so, that you're so, really interested in so uh, if you look at the 23 years i did this work so when i was doing the clinical work so basically there's life before i found twitter and, and, and after so yeah. before twitter i nobody really knew what i was doing i published loads of academic papers but you know academic papers are only read by the people who wrote it and the people who review it for the journal. Yeah. I mean, I don't think my mother even read them. So I was I was in this sort of like world of my own, writing papers and and you know, some people heard of what I was doing. Then I joined Twitter and realized, oh my goodness, I'm not the only gender critical person out there. And all of a sudden I had like 4,000 Twitter followers and everyone knew what I was doing. Um, I mean, so the, the trans activists have, some of them have always known what I was doing because I wrote a letter in the Telegraph once with a, some colleagues that said that the, that changing your legal sex after a sex change was a was a was a triumph of fantasy of reality, and that got people annoyed. Hmm. So they knew about me then, and did they tried to cancel conferences and stuff. But I was pretty much under the radar. But now I'm, I think now I'm on, on the top ten kill list of oh. uh, people. So really, you know, you rolling and yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, so so now I don't see any gender people now. I've seen enough of them. I, I did it for. A, a long time and I saw a lot of them. I saw them every week for 10 years. I've done that. So now I do things like this. I talk about it. I think I'm more useful now 
talking to people about it and helping them understand more about it, writing books on it, yeah, rather than you know, books for everyone to read, not just a paper for me to read. Yeah, you know, accessible, being accessible, going a podcast, doing interviews. Um, so, so that's that's the gender stuff I do. The, the 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 clinical work with gender is I see parents, so I see parents of people, and I'm helping them, you know, try and sort of get their head around it. Yeah, but it's a very small part of my work. So now most of my work is with, you know, nice hardworking people who are depressed, anxious, OCD, trauma, yeah. ADHD, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I can, the gender work I continue to do is more of a teaching educational stuff. Yeah. Is there an arc? Do you see an arc to the gender madness or gender ideology? How it's going to unfold? So the, 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 the there's, there's a, there's, there's two factors. So the, the unhelpful factor is that in Britain and I don't know, probably in America, definitely in Canada there's this push to ban exploratory therapy under the premise that it's conversion therapy. So what people want is only affirmation therapy. And what I've said is affirmation therapy is not therapy. No, it's, it's not therapy. Yeah. So, you know, if really? you had a child who suddenly said, oh, I think I'm a boy or a girl, what you would really hope is that somewhere, someone clinical will, will sit with that person and say, really, why? How did you come to that? Banning anything other than affirmation therapy would make that illegal. So therapists, and myself included, don't want to go anywhere near gender now because we're just setting ourselves up for legal cases, you know, uh, accusing us of being conversion therapists. When we're not, we're just exploratory therapists. Affirmation, if, as soon as you start saying to someone, oh, yes, you're right, you're born in the wrong body, that's grooming. That's colluding and grooming. If, as a psychiatrist, I have a patient who is anorexic and really thin and believes they really should be thinner, I don't affirm them. I think, well, no, you're you're unwell. You, you believe you should be thinner, but I but I think that would be you know. So if I have a depressed person who believes they really should be dead, I don't affirm that. You know. So so we're used to challenging belief states in psychiatry. Yet trans is this, you know, don't touch me, don't touch that card. Yeah. Is that so sustainable? The bad thing, well, you'll be hard pushed to find therapists now who'll go anywhere near someone with gender. The only people that will are the affirmation grooming type yeah. approaches. So that's the bad thing. The good thing is it's getting so nonsensical that everyone's peaking. You know, I was I was talking to a parent whose daughter is being trans by the school against the parents' wishes. So she's being affirmed as a boy, and the parents are saying, please don't do that, she's not a boy. Mm -hmm. They're going, no, we have to. And she said, well, the only consolation is, in, in school, she's sitting next to someone who's being affirmed as a pterodactyl on one side, and someone being affirmed as a cat on the other side. I mean, that's how nonsensical it's getting. We're having teachers and lecturers going on courses to be trained on how to deal with people identifying as cat gender. We've got schools giving litter trays to pupils to go to the toilet in. I'm really hoping they give them cat food rather than normal food. Um, you know, that's a, so, you know, a biology teacher can collude with an idea with a child that they're an extinct animal. I mean, that's how nonsensical we're getting. But but the good thing is it's so nonsensical that more people are peeking going, this is madness. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, I guess it's still a long push. If if there's still, is it really the case that convert any exploratory therapy is now conversion therapy in in your country? No, no, but, the, but in this very black and white way, it's, they're saying if it's not affirmation, it's conversion. There's but no other option. So is that is that encoded conversion. in law, or is that just kind of where it's going? No, we, we've managed to push back. Okay. In because I think that you know the politicians know it's mad, but they they they're lobbied so much by people like Stonewall and Mermaids. Yeah. And you, know, you get these politicians who are really misinformed holding up posters going ban conversion therapy and thinking, you don't really know what you're talking about. Was there, um, I know this is kind of uh, peeking into controversial or, uh, uh, you know, confidentiality problems, but was there like a really fun uh, case that you had that was not like totally uh, disgusting or disturbing, but just something like really wacky? Oh, I don't want to any confidentiality, but yeah. one funny moment was when I had um, a patient who would come with a MP3 recorder, it was before iPhones, around, around his neck. 
and I saw him for a few years, and he was con- by the start. He was convinced he was a, he was a woman, and then I'm sure. Then he, by the fun, end of it, he was fine. He was like, "Let's see him." And I said, to, "I said to him all the time, I said, why are you why are you wearing a recording?" He said, "Well, I have to remember every word you said." I said, "Look, honestly, you remember. Everyone remembers what happens in therapy. If you don't, and, and then he, then then he stopped wearing it, and I said, um, "Hey, you've forgotten your recording." He said, "No, I think you were right because I do actually remember what you say." I said, "Oh right," and he said, um, and "Then he went ash and white," and then I said, "What was wrong?" He said, "I sold it on eBay and I didn't wipe it." <laughs> so, so, so he sold he sold three years of. Uh, uh, gender exploratory therapy. Oh, uh, no. I'm expecting on eBay. That's just floating out there somewhere. It's going to pop up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great. I don't so, think it's that interesting. I, just, I, just, you know, I don't know. It's probably, uh, if you remembered it, it's probably pretty interesting. So um, your book, D-Trans, hit the shelves in October, October 9th. And mm. that'll be available on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. And anything else that you plug? Do you do... Uh, do you, do you I mean, my first book, Trans, was, was was quite diplomatic. Oh, yeah. So I would just say, skip that, just go to this one. Okay. Why was it so dis- diplomatic? Were you doing a well, kind of both sides thing? It was or? published by a charity and had to, it couldn't be too controversial. Okay. So, you know, so yeah. it was a bit diplomatic. So I would say just read this one. Yeah. And uh, any appearances or do you run anything else like... Uh... No, anyone who invites me to talk on something, I will, unless you're going to put me head to head with some activist, which is, you know, my idea of hell. Yeah. So uh, I'm always happy to talk. And you know, like I said in the book, it's written so that anyone with no understanding whatsoever will understand it, and um, it'll arm you with being able to win any argument you have with anyone who, who's woke, who tries to convince you that. So it debunks all the stuff like born in the wrong body, like if you don't affirm a trans-identifying child, they're going to kill themselves. It, all these things which are complete nonsense and all the only 1% of, of, of transitioners regret it. This is nonsense. This is made up stats. Mm. So it's the only intervention in the world where there's no follow-up studies. Mm. <laughs> it, like, you know, if you get your eyelashes tinted, there's probably follow-up studies. You know, you, you're, you're de-sexing someone, castrating them and reassembling their body. You don't do a follow-up study. And, you know, of the people I saw, 26% of my patients were post-op regretters. So that's not 26% all percent of all gender people. It's my population sample. And none of them had been followed up. Hmm. So they said, well, no. Well, they, they said they'd either gone back to the gender clinics they said, no, we gave you what you want. We can't do anything. Or they said they didn't go back because they thought, what can I do? I'm, I'm embarrassed. I, I convinced everyone to give me what I wanted. There's no way I'm telling you it was a mistake now. Yeah. So they, they're absent data. Yeah. So yeah. so all, all the myths that people will come up with are debunked in the book. What's the suicide myth? Like the quick and dirty, like how to debunk that? So, so there's no follow-up studies. So we don't know what the suicide rate is if you do or don't affirm someone. What we do know is that there's a, a massively high suicide rate in trans people anyway and detransitioners so it's not that you're preventing anything suicidal happening by not affirming them mm-hmm. it's just this population but, but there's, there's massive comorbidity with other conditions trauma autism um you know emotional person emotionally unstable personality disorder all these other things which, which come with their own risks so mm-hmm. you know as someone identifying as trans doesn't mean they don't have any other conditions they will probably have other serious psychopathology yeah. And it's that that's the problem. So so treat that. Yeah. And the danger is as soon as you say someone's trans, you exempt them from any treatment of any other mental health problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's uh, part of the reason that um, these law- lawsuits are coming up, because it's uh, just malpractice. Absolutely, about time. Yeah. yeah. Well, Doctor, thank you very much for your evening. It was great to hang out with thank you. Thank you for having me. I thank hope you. your dog is well uh, hydrated and that you guys are going to go on a run now. He's, he's an English bulldog. They don't move. Oh, they don't. They just kind of sit they there and moving. eat children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If you walk, if you, if you if you drag them out of the house, they'll walk to the car and plant their feet down. <laughs> oh, that's they cool. don't like walking. But he's, he's like me. I hate exercise, so yeah. you know, I lift heavy objects, but I don't do cardio. He's like, okay. he's like, yeah. like me. He doesn't do cardio. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, he he'll get uh, to be lifted by you uh, as your yeah, he's thirty-five kilograms. Yeah. Your I'm like Benji. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Get the, book, yeah, get the book. Yeah, get the book and uh, links are in the description. Boom. Thank you.